What you need to do is get the politics right, you need to get the right team, you need to pare it down to what you really need to do. Science sisters, they're here to There's talk. There's not as many women as well involved as I would like. No, <laughs> I do not tell anybody what to do. Your job as a manager is to ensure oh, that you yeah, your home. I think if there's life, it's on Venus. Science sisters, let's start the show. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Science Sisters. I'm your host Iris van Zelst and today I'm joined by Richard Gill, who is a professor at Intraplate Tectonics at Royal Holloway University of London. And perhaps most excitingly, he's also the lead proposer and lead scientist of Envision, the new mission to Venus that has recently been selected by ESA. I thought it would be great to talk about Envision, mm -hmm. your role in it, and also how you manage all of the people and organize it. How did it start and which steps did you need to take because now it's been selected. How long have we got? Um, <laughs> I have to go back a long way. My background is in Venus, obviously. I did my PhD on Venus and I've worked on Venus data for as long as any of you have been alive. The problem is that Venus doesn't pay the bills. Once Mars got exciting, you know, with the fake news about bacteria and things like that, there was an unstoppable program of, of Mars and a very lonely voice saying, What about Venus? And then in I guess the early 2000s, ESA had a spare Mars mission, Mars Express. They built a flight spare for it, and they said, what can we do with this? And there were lots of different proposals. It could go to Mars, it could go and do something else, and whatever. And the one that they liked and, and that won was Venus Express. Do the same thing, basically, at Venus. Slightly different instruments, because the planet's a little bit different to Mars. <laughs> but really, focus on the atmosphere. Let's think about Venus, how and why it has this runaway greenhouse. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if you could put one of our Earth observing radars on it. But it was too big and too massive and too difficult to do on Venus Express. But that idea was sort of kicking around for a little while, along with other people having ideas about balloons, for example. So you were already involved in Venus Express, or at least took mm -hmm. inspiration from that? Took inspiration. I was not involved in Venus Express, but I know people working on Venus Express and I went to Venus meetings and, and okay. so on. At one of those meetings, actually my PhD student at the time, Chris Cochran, was presenting a poster and he got talking to people about radar and the word came back why don't you propose it the m3 call is coming out soon propose a radar mission to venus so that's what i did and that was the first envision proposal in 2010 and it was a, a christmas tree as they're called you know every instrument we could think of was on it and we were trying to do all, all kinds of different things it went through the system it was rejected technically obviously but peter faulkner who i think you know yeah. um, phoned me up and said every successful ESA mission has failed the technical review. We really like the idea behind your mission. Take an Earth observation radar to Venus. What you need to do is get the politics right, you need to get the right team, you need to pare it down to what you really need to do to make it work. And so over the next year or two we had various meetings and I remember one particular EPSC meeting. We were all sat outside talking about Venus and talking about the different missions we might do, the balloons and other things, and the radar mission. And Dima, who was project scientist for Venus Express, walked over to us and he said, look, you're a small group, a small community in Europe, you're not competing with Mars or the Moon or Mercury. They're sort of being done. Venus has its time as a planetary mission, but you've got to compete with the cosmologists and the astronomers. And that means you've got to work together for what you think is the best, most successful proposal you could come up with that will maybe start a program of Venus exploration. And out of that the, the envision that you know now was born we sat around and around that table everyone including Colin who was lead proposer of, of EVE the balloon mission all said no this is the one that we should go with envision is the one that's going to unlock Venus for everybody else and all these other missions will follow on and they all got behind it and so there was only ever one Venus proposal from that moment onwards from Europe the M4 proposal I think was in many ways our best proposal it was the high point of what we could do but it probably wasn't very realistic <laughs> and and it came back you're over budget lovely mission but we can't fly you so what is this m3 m4 is it just successive calls yes yeah, so it... sorry i should have explained that so so isa run a series of different missions small medium and large mm -hmm. s l m and l oh, m, is medium. <laughs> m is medium got it this was the third call yeah, for yeah. a medium class mission then the fourth call and now we're on the fifth 
Cool. So yeah, so M4, I think we sort of we really thought about the science, and it was the best possible science mission, but it wasn't realistic within the budget, within the parameters of a medium class mission. So that's what we focused on for M5. We put everything together, and I think it worked. But when it came to it, we were still assessed as over budget. Oh, I don't know how far over budget we were really, but um, 50, 50 million euros or. 100 million euros, whatever it was. They don't tell you, so we don't know. Okay. Having been rejected, Peter, I think, phoned us up and said, you've been unrejected. Okay, that's a strange uh, concept. <laughs> to cut a long story short, basically NASA came in with a, a large sum of money and became part of the Envision team. And that's where we were middle of phase A. We then had to make it all work, which was actually a lot of work. It was hard work. You know, we, we had a we had 10 years of working together as Europeans on this and we knew what we wanted and we all worked together and we all thought pretty much the same. And then we had two Americans who came in completely new to the whole thing and new to ESA as well. And they had very different ideas about what they wanted and it wasn't the same thing. So there was a, there was a lot of work to reach a mission design that satisfied everybody as much as possible. You can't satisfy everyone, but you know, you can get close to it. So how big was the team? Or, you know... The Europeans, the Americans, how many people are we talking about? So, officially, on the science study team, there were 12 people. Oh, that's not that much. Um, that's the group that advises ESA on, on the science for the mission. So that had two these two Americans that okay. had them on, on board. I was lead scientist of that SST, it's called. And, and then there were a number of other people. The PIs were separate, but they were actually involved in every meeting that we had. Um, so they, they had a, a science working group. They had a, their own separate meeting for the sort of technical instrument design aspects. And mission design but the overall science was through the SST. Behind that I mean there must be upwards of 100 European scientists working in their various teams. Yeah so it's a big group of people. So how did you find those original 12? Just because of meetings and you knew each other? Uh, so, so the SST is chosen by ESA, uh -huh. um, although the two Americans obviously chosen by NASA. In both cases, they phoned me up and said, you know, we have some ideas, what do you think? So no, there were no surprises in that sense. But, um, you know, by, that, by this stage, you know most of the community. Yeah. The European side sort of made itself out of Venus Express and, and the other people who were interested in. And we all, we all get along, actually, really well. We've had some nice meetings together. We've met on each other's turf. Um, the next one we want is Berlin, actually. So. <laughs> so is it a very diverse team? Are there a lot of women involved? There's not as many women as well involved as I would like, but there are quite a lot of women involved. On the SST, it was almost 50-50. I think it was, I think it was five to seven. That's pretty be. good. So it was pretty good in that respect. In the wider team, yeah, there's a lot. I mean. Several of the PIs are women. I don't, I don't think there's any issues on that front. I was explaining to you earlier how Royal Holloway was founded for women 150 years ago nearly by somebody who wanted to really empower women in science. I think he would be pretty upset to find that we're still having to do that now. It's pretty shocking, really. It's not so diverse racially, I have to say. I mean, obviously across Europe, it's, there's lots of different Europeans involved, but you know there are actually very few, particularly black people, in, in science generally. Yeah. And therefore, at this level of, of mission development, which I think is a real, a real shame as well. It would be nice to see more. One of the strange things you've got to get your head around proposing a mission is that you don't propose it for yourself. I mean, obviously, you want the science that you want to come out of it. You know, given that I first thought of this and proposed it 12 years ago, 13 years ago, something like that, and it will be another 13 years before we start getting data from the mission, 26 years of my life, <laughs> has gone by, which is the prime of my career. So it's not going to be me that benefits from this mission in the same way that I'm sure it wasn't the people, the PI, whatever of Magellan that benefited from Magellan. It was me. Also, in terms of diversity, there is a sense of you do this for the community. You want the best going forwards. So we want to inspire people like you who will be in your prime of your career to be, to be in the right place at the right time when it happens. To, to take advantage of it. That's my legacy. <laughs> I'm really looking forward because the launch is hypothetically going to be in 2032. What they well, say? even more hypothetically, uh, hopefully 2031. They're trying to bring it forwards mm -hmm. by a year because the launch opportunities are better this ah. side of 2032, basically. It's less than. It would also decade. probably be a first for a space mission to go earlier than planned. Yeah. That's not common. That's not common. <laughs> so as the lead scientist and the lead proposer, what exactly was your role? Do you actively tell people what to do or do you kind of call the meetings and try to bring people together? I do not tell anybody what to do. 
right? For one thing, that's not my leadership style. I've always been a, a manager who, who believes in an upside-down pyramid. And, and I've learned that from long ago. I used to work in a cafe when I was much younger, uh, after my PhD, oddly enough. I worked in a, in a cafe and became assistant manager. And one day I was you know, doing the dishes when some of the waitresses came in. And they were, what are you doing here? Why isn't the dishwasher here? Well, the dishwasher phoned up 15 minutes before he was due to be here saying, you know, he'd had an accident and was in hospital, actually on his way to hospital. Oh, Nothing okay. serious, but, you know, he'd come off his bike and everything and it was, you know, these things happened. Um, there was no time to find a replacement, so I did the dishes. That's managing. It's, it's managing an immediate problem, but your job as a manager is to ensure that things go smoothly and that, that people are enabled to do what they are good at doing. And I still see that as my role. So the best people for this mission are the people who drive the science and drive the instruments. I do include myself as one of those people. I mean, I, you know, I, I propose the radar and, and the science that we want out of it. So I definitely come with an angle as well. But in, in many respects, since that's gone to NASA as an instrument, I do have more independence now. And one of the key goals of the mission, or the philosophies, I suppose, of the mission, is that it's holistic. These instruments work together, and by working together, we get more than the sum of the parts out of it. So all the instruments work together to help each other. But also, our total knowledge, our total science that we can get from this, goes up a lot by working together, by having complementary measurements. And we've learned that with Earth observation, particularly. But that kind of team requires a leader, a manager, who supports all that is going on. And that's what I try to do. ESA managed the project. So we also have a, a, a study scientist, okay. and we have a study team who is managed by Thomas Warren and they report to ESA and that is a top-down management you know they direct what happens and it happens we interface at the, at the boundary between the two I think to begin with ESA were completely flummoxed by our relationship you know the way we were working as a team but they have come to really appreciate it they know now that if they if they take me to one side to have a conversation about something that we need to do I will take that to the team and we will discuss it and we will come up with a solution or I will suggest something that I know is in everyone's best interests but equally we you know we've made some hard decisions along the way we've had to ultimately drop at the moment the the measurement that I want to make at Venus which is interferometry that's a hard thing to decide to do to sacrifice your own personal interest so you do have to make difficult decisions and and ultimately it is me that makes that decision but we make it as a team as much as we can I like that kind of management style and I don't think it's very common in academic research groups per se which is a pity because it's so much nicer to work in a team i think yeah. personally because you can learn so much from everyone and everyone has their own expertise and you can just you can just lift each other up to much greater how that you could reach yeah. individually i get that i mean i think a lot of that comes from you know i'm the person who brings in the money or whatever and, and you know i employ you to do this and i have a great advantage in that respect in that i never bring in any money in <laughs> Congratulations! I'm being slightly unfair to my colleagues. Really, Colin Wilson, Thomas Wiedemann and myself are a triumvirate. I'm not a singular leader. I'm not an emperor. This was something that ESA really struggled to get their head around. The fact that actually Colin, Thomas and I led the team and we brought our own areas of capability, expertise and so on to it. I think my role as a leader worked in that way because I lead in the way I do, allowing Colin and Thomas to really shine and, and lead in the way that they do. Colin is very good politically, if I can put it that way, in smoothing systems. He knows what different people are trying to say rather than what they're actually saying. I tend to listen to the words and get upset or something. Colin listens to the intent. And he's very, very good at that respect and, and he can translate between us. He can also literally translate. He knows many languages. And he's very well known across Europe because he was effectively deputy to Dima on, on the Venus Express. As colleagues, and as we're, we're very much partners in that respect. Thomas is a absolutely fantastic organiser, very, very methodical, loves being behind the scenes, doesn't particularly put his head forwards, but he would much rather smooth everything over, make sure all the paperwork is done, make sure everybody has got what they need and is happy. He will listen to all the different voices and pull it all together. And I'm a good spokesman. Actually, I think my strength really is in standing up in front of a big group of meeting and inspiring 
inspiring people to believe in, in vision and believe in Venus. Yeah, um, definitely. As you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we're here now. <laughs> You've traditionally been very successful in this. So, you know, and that comes from teaching, I think, you know, yeah. especially teaching in the field, I find. The three of us together work extremely well. So how is uh, Envision complementary to Theratos or Da Vinci? That depends on when you ask. We've had about two years of the Americans trying to turn Envision into Veritas because they thought this mission's $100 million, Veritas is $600 million, NASA's bound to pick Envision and not Veritas, so they're in competition. So the people we had were really desperate to try and make sure that Envision delivered Veritas science. And that was a large part of the conflicting things that we had. Ironically, at the end of that process, Veritas and Envision have been selected, and the first thing Americans have said is that Envision looks just like Veritas. It doesn't, even now, it doesn't look the same. There are certain overlaps because we had to deliver topography and gravity and things like that, that Veritas will deliver. So there will be changes because we don't need to do that. That means we can focus much more on the type of science we really are wanting to do, which is the repeat observations, the activity detection, the high resolution, the polarimetry, all those sorts of things with the radar. And I think all of those things are unique to Envision. You couldn't do what we're planning to do with Veritas. Veritas is a very much global mission. We are not. We're a targeted mission. We do collect some global data from instruments that have never been flown before, but we're really focusing in on, on particular examples from a science point of view of features that we want to understand and throwing everything at understanding. I'd say we're a much more science-focused mission and less of a reconnaissance mission. There are three areas of envisioned science. There's the activity in terms of volcanism and tectonism and weathering and, and all those sorts of processes, and there's how that activity feeds into the atmosphere and climate, mm -hmm. and then there's the history, how do Venus get to be the way it is today. And so the targets focus on those different elements. So we have some targets that are volcanoes. Some of them we think will be active, like Matmons. They're big volcanoes, and, and we think they're like Hawaii and quite regularly active. But actually, Venus has upwards of 85,000 volcanoes that are, you know, five kilometers across or smaller, all over the place. And so we want a good selection of those, because probably 2,000 of them are active now, or more. We want to be able to find them, and we don't know where they are. But actually, their distribution tells us a lot about how Venus works as a planet so we want to capture that and that's related to tectonics as well we want to understand are the rifts active we think they are are mountain belts active in places probably but there are other things where we want to understand the, the deeper history so we want to look at the plains we want to look at impact craters if you could image all of Europe, which we do regularly, you would see the Alps deforming now. You would see the ancient Craton in Scandinavia and you'd see the whole history of the planet. And that's, that's something we want to get at. Another thing that I read on the website of Envision, which I thought was really fun, is that actually on Venus, most of the features have been named after women, mythical, legendary women, Yeah, which seems like a very nice thing to do. Well, so that's actually a function of the uh, International Astronomical yeah. Union. They decided after actually a few things had been named, so Alpha, Beta and Maxwell Montes had all, already been named and those names were retained. But all other names are given female names goddess names of various kinds, different goddesses and things for different features, because it's Venus, the female planet. All the names on Mars are given male names, male gods and so on, because Mars is the male planet. Do you know, honestly, when I was a PhD student, people used to say to me, why do you want to work on the female planet? Why wouldn't you want to work on the male planet? Seriously? I mean, if you... Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, people used to say such things. It's bizarre. I mean, I don't think of Venus as a female planet any more no. than I think of Mars as a male planet. I think of them as planets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I joke a little bit about what people used to say, but they did used to say this. But on my PhD, I worked on Diana Chasma ah. in, and Artemis Chasma, actually. Yeah. Diana Chasma, mainly, which is in Aphrodite Terra on Venus. So, you know, basically, I worked on this beautiful goddess huntress, or whatever she is, on the goddess of love in Greek, on the goddess of love in Latin. So, I think that's pretty nice. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Better than working on the god of war, isn't it? I mean, I think Venus is so exciting and interesting because it's the only other Earth-sized planet. Yeah. And we don't understand Earth-sized planets. Yeah. That's what's really cool. I think if there's life, it's on Venus. I don't think there is life on Venus, but I think if there was going to be life anywhere, it would be on Venus because the chemistry tells you so. Yeah, if you want to go to a planet where we don't know the answers, as you know, go to Venus. Yeah, this was incredibly interesting. So thank you so much for telling all these things. It's a pleasure. Uh, I yeah. like talking, as you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
thank you so much for watching all the way to this point in the video uh, there will be some links in the description below about Envision and about Rich if you want more information if you liked it like it and subscribe while you're at it I will see you in the next episode bye 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 and, yeah. and this isn't quite the BBC who were filming as we speak yeah just up the, up the uh, hill they did have a slightly higher production budget yeah. I mean, we don't have a budget, so... <laughs> <laughs> I'm singularly unsuccessful at getting funded. And I wore a green shirt for green tea. Maybe I shouldn't say this on camera.